Hi guys, so today we're going to look at how to identify the different types of igneous intrusions. Now just as a quick recap, igneous comes from the Latin word ignis, which means fire. Hence the nice little background with all the flames. So igneous rocks are then, therefore, magmatic rocks. In other words, rocks that form from the magma beneath the surface of the earth. Okay, let's look at this nice little image you have in front of you. I hope it's clear and that you can see. First thing, like I said, we're going to look at is just identifying the different types of igneous intrusions. If you look here at the bottom, all of this here below is known as magma. It's magma because it hasn't solidified yet. And it's magma because it's below the surface of the earth, all these red lines. As soon as magma reaches the surface of the earth and flows out onto the surface of the earth, it is known as lava. So this is a lava outpouring or a lava flow. All of this here below is known as magma. Now all of these have different names. Here at the bottom, we have what we call a magma chamber. And as soon as it makes these little plumes close to these arms that go up, We'll call this batholiths. So we've got quite a number of batholiths here. We've got a batholith over there, batholith over here, batholith over there. But your batholiths form part of your magma chamber. They're very far below the surface of the earth, very deep. And if through time and weathering and erosion, they are exposed to the surface of the earth, they form these big, large masses of rock. Now, what is really important to note is that with these big, large masses of rock, we'll give it the term massive. In other words, it's a massive igneous rock. Not massive because of its size, but just simply massive because it won't have bedding planes like the sedimentary rocks. So on top here, we've got some sedimentary rocks or sedimentary layers, and they have bedding planes. These planes form because they deposit one layer on top of the other. You'll see, however, that we can have multiple intrusions, then we form these alternations. But never would we say that magmatic rocks or igneous rocks have bedding planes. They're just massive. Okay, so here at the bottom, we've got the magma chamber. When it bulges out and starts reaching or moving towards the surface, it forms a batholith. And then these little arms that actually try and extend towards the surface, so that arm over there, this one over here, this one over here, these are all known as dikes. So dike is basically a vertically moving pipe of magmatic material. Now, as soon as your magma moves along this pipe or this dike, it actually starts reaching the surface of the earth. And when it does over here and it reaches a volcanic point or an outpouring of some sorts, we'll call it a pipe. So in this case, we'll have a volcanic pipe. But anything further below the surface of the earth over here, these are all known as dikes. As you can see, these dikes all try to move towards the surface of the earth, but they don't all reach it. We've got a little mushroom shaped dome over here that didn't make it. These looks like, uh, look like horizontal arms stretching out towards the sides. They didn't make it. And then there's this little bowl shaped over here that didn't make it either. Now each of these actually have different names. If we look at this first one, which has this little mushroom type of shape or dome type of shape, we'll call this a lacolith. So this is a lacolith. And with lacoliths, they actually push the sedimentary layers up to form a little bulge over here, as you can see. So this is a lacolith, a small mushroom-shaped intrusion, and it causes the sedimentary layers on top to be pushed up a little bit more. As your magma, however, comes into contact with it, you would form metamorphic rocks around the igneous body. Okay, lacolith. Now let's move to something that looks like a lacolith, but it's upside down. It forms a little bowl. And as you can see here, it now pushes your layers downwards. It compresses it. And this upside down shape or this bowl shaped um, intrusion over here is known as a lapolith or a lopolith. So the lopoliths are usually made up of granite, um, almost the same as your big batholiths, etc. And they push your sedimentary layers or any layers downwards. So we've got magma chamber, batholith, dikes, 
localets, lopolets, and then we've got one more over here. This one over here. It looks like arms, but it's actually forming a whole layer, like a sheet of magma. And as you can see, it's actually following this nice bedding plane over here. It's running all along that. Now, as soon as magma intrudes the sedimentary layers or the bedding planes, we would call this a sill. So a sill is a horizontal layer of magma, which will eventually cool down, etc. Good. Now, why is this important for us? On top of forming these different types of intrusions, we can actually form what is known as layered igneous intrusion. Intrusions. Now, it's known as layered igneous intrusions because you'd have one intrusion which would deposit a bit of magma. So over here, it looks like we actually had a nice um, lopolith. So we had a nice lopolith over here. It intruded again to form a very long sill. This blue one formed a nice long sill. And then we had this green intrusion, which was part of the Rustenburg layer. So it formed a lopolith again. Over here, the pink, it seems like it formed a lacolith on this side, etc. So when our igneous intrusions, um, or when this occurs in our igneous intrusions, we call it layered igneous intrusions. And there's one important one that you need to know about, and it's the Bushveld igneous complex. Now, if you've put two and two together, you'll realize or notice that we actually live in the Bushveld. So this does, in fact, occur all around us, and it hosts a lot of important minerals. It's got a few heavy elements or heavy metals in it as well, such as cadmium, um, chromite, etc. But it also hosts platinum, palladium, even trace amounts of gold. So it's important from an economic perspective because you can actually mine it. However, not all these intrusive layers would contain those minerals you'd actually have to go and try and figure out which ones do. So you'd have to take samples, test them, etc. But here's a nice little crosscut of the Bushveld igneous complex, which is present where we are. If we look at this from an aerial point of view, the only rocks that we can still see um, from the Bushveld igneous complex are all these funny blue ones. And I put this picture in here specifically to show you that all these symbols there are actually two spades, or a spade and a shovel, I'm not sure. It's not very clear. But all these symbols indicate different mining sites. So our layered intrusion, our layered igneous intrusion, the Bushveld igneous complex, is a very important igneous intrusion from where we mine a lot of valuable minerals. Over here, this is where we are. There's little red dots over there, Mokopane. And we've got a plat reef close to us. It's part of the Ivanhoe mine. I actually helped them develop their geological models, so uh, quite interesting stuff. Let's return back to our igneous body. So we said they're massive. In other words, they don't actually form bedding planes. And because they're massive, when they cool down, they will form different types of joints. Now the first one, which I think is pretty um, self-explanatory, is a cooling joint, or the more famous and correct term for it, is a contractual joint. So the contractual joint forms when these massive igneous bodies start cooling. And contractual joints run downwards, so they run vertically down the big massive igneous body. So here we've got a little granitic dome, probably formed from a batholith. Could have been a lacolith as well. And all these vertical joints that you see over here were cooling joints or contractual joints. So as the rock cooled, as the magma cooled, it started uh, cracking and breaking apart to form these joints. Along with cooling down, we had a lot of weight from the surface of the earth that would press down on this body. And because of that, we would form these offloading joints. So offloading joints, um, form when the top layers of material that were deposited on top of it, all those sedimentary layers, actually start eroding and start being removed away. So this is basically like a pressure release. When we remove the top material, the pressure is released and we form offloading joints. 
awesome. Thank you.